Tonight, alcohol illegally sold to teenagers in Auckland. Oh, how thick is this guy? A contamination mystery on the Kapiti coast. We don't know what's actually caused the deaths of these fish. If the dogs do eat the fish, then they could become ill. And substandard housing in a carport. Interesting. Looking like a mess. Not good. Is this area used at all? No. Not at all. At the Greater Wellington Regional Council, Environmental Protection Officer Naomi Middleton has been alerted to a potential crisis on the Kapiti coast. We're just heading down Paraparumu Beach and I got called out this afternoon by the Ministry of Fisheries who uh, spotted a lot of dead fish along the coastline here over about a 50 kilometre stretch. Unusually large numbers of dead fish have reportedly washed up along the coastline. Sometimes it's from fishing boats illegally dumping surplus fish, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. We're just heading off down the beach to see if we can see some of these fish that have washed up. Naomi's concerned the fish may have been poisoned. In similar cases around the country, fish contaminated with poison have caused the death of dogs and marine life such as penguins. Where all the birds are, that's a fairly good sign that there might be some fish floating around in the shallows. Right, let's go have a look. If contamination is the cause, then the public and animals using the beach could be in grave danger. They've had snapper and raised bream, and they reckon it's probably somewhere in the hundreds to thousands mark. We can't really rule out any possible cause at this stage. It could just be an environmental contaminant, or um, we could be looking at a biotoxin. Biotoxins are poisons that originate naturally from plants or animals. It's common with algal blooms for biotoxins to get into the food chain. Concerns raised that, seeing as we don't know what's actually caused the deaths of these fish, it might not be a good time for people to be fishing along this coast, or, you know, if the dogs do eat the fish, then they could become ill if it has been a contaminant that's caused the death. If the fish have been poisoned, then there is a significant risk for anyone who catches a live contaminated fish and then eats it. One reaction to such toxins includes weakness and paralysis of limbs, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea and breathing difficulties. Another is gastrointestinal symptoms and occasionally seizure. But there's also the worry of what a poison can do to wildlife. Naomi's concerned about the protected marine life in the area. Over here we've got the we've got a marine reserve um, out by Kapiti Island. And so, yeah, I mean it's a shame to think that um, the uh, fish species that live in this area um, are under threat when we've got um, this amazing resource out here that needs to be protected. Yeah, it's a real shame. With New Zealand fishery stocks already under threat, it's a worry that the incident could have been the result of dumping from a trawler. The really sad thing about this is that our fisheries are already under a lot of pressure. A lot of our species are uh, under pressure from a lot of different uh, sources and so this kind of um, needless waste just makes me really sad. As night falls, dead fish continue to wash up on the incoming tide, but Naomi still has no clues about the cause of the mysterious deaths. The next morning at Auckland's North Shore City Council, building and compliance officers Graham Jones and Karima Fuad are investigating a dwelling that has had illegal housing additions. Hey, we're going to... Um property in Glenfield now where we've been out to before. On a previous visit six months ago, a carport under a deck had been transformed into an additional dwelling, posing serious environmental and public risks. We've had a couple of issues with it. Originally we had a complaint as people sleeping underneath the deck on the property. We went out before Christmas. There are mattresses stored there. The addition was an illegal build that wasn't safe for housing people, so the council insisted it be demolished and returned to the original plan. There was a kitchen underneath the deck and there was also uh, a drain that obviously connected from the sink and just literally discharged discharge down the drives. With the wastewater discharging straight into the driveway, it then drains into the stormwater system and from there it can pollute waterways, potentially causing a lot of harm. 
pipe looks to have gone. Unless they've covered it up. No, it's still there. <laughs> Tricky. That's the discharge from the uh, washing machine. From the sink and washing machine underneath is so just literally yep. going down there. Into the it's road. <laughs> They're trying to cover it yeah, up. I know. Graham and Karima try to avoid expensive court cases by giving people a chance to toe the line, but concealing the pipe suggests these owners are doing anything but cooperating. This window's open, there's got to be somebody here, isn't there? Should we try that bottom Yeah, door? try the bottom door. Inspecting inside could be difficult. The house appears to have a multitude of front doors. Ah, let's have a go around here then. That's just back to where we were before. But as Graham and Karima continue their search for an occupant, they find more serious problems. <laughs> Another outdoor sink. Interesting. It's an ad hoc kitchen, looking like a mess. Not good. <laughs> There's another shed there with um, the a sink in it, so I've just got to have a look where the drain goes from that one. In a surprise discovery, they have stumbled across another illegal building addition. Well, we just had a wander around. We've got a garden shed here that's had a, a kitchen put in it. There are issues here. I mean, for starters, I can't see where the drain goes for that washing machine or sink. There's nowhere obvious. So that begs the question, is that just discharging across the garden somewhere? Like the illegal dwelling under the deck, this structure too is not consented, not plumbed, and a serious risk to public health and the environment. I can see the pipe work, but can't see where it goes, unfortunately. So uh, we've possibly got the similar issue as what we've got on the front. It's just literally discharging onto the ground. At a glance from the outside, the illegal additions all suggest something very suspicious is going on with this property. And the team haven't even inspected the interior yet. Chances are it's over tenanted. I mean, without getting inside, I can't really tell that from outside. However, looking at the sort of layout of the building, the additional kitchens, I have got reservations about it. I'm quite concerned, to be honest. And I think we're making an effort to get hold of the owners if they'll correspond with us and try and get inside it. Meanwhile, at Manaco City Council, District Licensing Officer Paul Radich and Constable Chris Lally from the Manaco Police are preparing for what's known as a controlled purchase operation. We've done these operations for about four years now. When we started doing them, the failure rate for the bottle stores in Manukau City was around 50%. It's come down to 10% in recent years, so, so we're making headway in terms of the overt battle against youth access to alcohol anyway. The operation involves sending a miner into bottle stores attempting to purchase alcohol. These operations are the district licence authority's primary tool in trying to combat underage drinking. The underage people we put in to these stores are clearly underage and there should be no question that there shouldn't be a sale. So when we're talking about failure rates, we're talking about those people who have failed to check for ID, failed, hit, failed to adhere to the sale of Liquor Act and completed a sale. But sending a 15-year-old into stores to purchase alcohol doesn't come without risks and the main priority is to keep the minor out of harm's way and to ensure he follows the correct procedure. If they ask for, your ID, for ID, you don't have any on you, and you shouldn't have any on you now. Yeah. Um, if they ask for your age, you have to give them the true age, so you can't lie about anything. Yeah. Okay. If you don't feel comfortable about going into place, don't worry about going into it. Okay. Yeah. It's your safety's first. Yeah. What we want to make sure is if you don't want to go in there, that's cool. All the stores in this operation have had previous decisions that have gone before the Liquor Licence Authority. What you say? No ID, no sale, mate. So, yeah. Oh my God, maybe she's leaving. While some stores are lifting their game, others are finding ways to not get caught. Some of the bottle stores that we'll go to today, they have what they refer to as security people. Uh, we refer to them as spotters because those security people won't actually do anything until they see us. You'll see the security person as the young person approaches the store, they will look around to see if they can see us. And then, obviously, if we're spotted, they'll go in and make sure that the sale doesn't happen. So it's one of the common practices now to have spotters or security people outside. Again, the miner returns from the store empty-handed. Oh, nearly. Guy came in from outside? No, nah, he was on the phone. And then um, he did it all, and then he got halfway through his conversation and looked at me kind of funny. <laughs> Is that when is that when he asked for ID? Yeah. Oh. It sounds like a spotter could have alerted the store owner, causing him to abort the sale. Yeah, well, it sounded like he was going to sell. It sounded, yeah. it sounded yeah, very cause, much. Yeah, because I gave him the money and he took it. He and he scanned it as well, Yeah, didn't and he? Then, then 
He was talking on the phone and looked me awful funny all of a sudden and just said, oh, you got any ID? And then I said, didn't have any, he went kind of pale. Oh, well, at least he didn't sell. It's a bonus. It's a bonus. On to another previous offender, but not a spotter in sight. For God's sake! Second time! Oh, how thick is this guy? On Auckland's North Shore, Building and Compliance Officers Graham Jones and Karima Fuad are investigating a property where a carport had been illegally converted into an additional dwelling. There was a kitchen underneath the deck and there was also uh, a drain that obviously connected from the sink and just literally just start discharged down the drives. Finding someone to talk to and show them inside proved difficult, but what they did find was another illegal addition. No, we just had a wander around. We've got a garden shed here that's had a kitchen put in it. There are possible issues here. I mean, for starters, I can't see where the drain goes for that washing machine or sink. There's nowhere obvious. And as they continue searching, their persistence finally pays off, and a sleepy tenant greets them from one of the many doors. It's all right. Hi. From council. Come to have a look at the building downstairs. We've come in here before. Is there a chance I can open up the door under the, under the patio, you know, the one outside, under the deck? It's all corrugated tin around it. Oh, yeah. yeah. The occupant agrees to show Graham and Karima okay. down to the carport under the deck. Yeah, I just need to have a look in there. From the outside, it looks like nothing has changed. But what about inside? Right. Is this area used at all? No. Not at all? This side. This side. People that live in the bottom of the house use it. Because I've asked them to take the sink out, you see, and have a general sort out, and it's not been done, has it? This is very disappointing. The owners have had six months, but there's no sign they've done anything to address the problems. What's more, there's evidence to suggest the place is still in use. It's still wet and a lot of water on the floor. Should I um, run the tap and see if it's coming out there? You can try it, yeah? Why yeah. not? The sink and the washing machine all drain into the one pipe. Yep. By turning the water on from the inside, it's discharging straight under here, which is running down into the drain. That potentially is going to be discharging into the streams, and especially if they're using detergent in the, um, the sink area, it's you know, going to have detrimental effects to the stream, the aquatic life. Polluting the stream alone carries a hefty fine of $750, but the problems unfolding at this property could turn out to be far greater than initially thought. It's be a case of going up there and trying to find out well, trying to get into it, to be honest, and have a good look around. Because I suspect there's a lot of rooms locked off in it. And I say there's certainly two ad hoc kitchens on the place, which uh, is a bit of a concern on a single dwelling. Single dwelling means only one lot of occupants. But this kitchen and the other one they've discovered suggest it's rented out to a number of tenants. Back with District Licensing Officer Paul Radich and Constable Chris Lally. They're out on a controlled purchase operation, sending a miner in to try and buy alcohol. What'd you say? No idea, no sale, mate. But any hopes of getting a clean slate were dashed when a previous offending store again let a teenager buy alcohol. For God's sake! Second time! Oh, how thick is this guy? Chris and Paul must immediately take a statement, which may need to be used at a later date in a prosecution hearing. How long do you think you're in the shop for? Probably about two minutes. Running a bottle store, there are two things. Ask for ID um, and make sure they're not, you're not selling to any drugs. This kid's 15 years old, he's well short of what the required age is and certainly doesn't look like he's 18 where you'd be comfortable enough to say, oh yeah, I don't need any ID. It's just, it's just really, really, really dumb. This small $11 sale will now result in heavy fines and penalties for the operator if the case goes to a hearing, or temporary closure with losses of up to $12,000 in sales. Because you'll have to close on a Friday uh, for two days now, or three days now, because this is the second time we've caught him. So, time to share the bad news. Hi. Hello. How are you? Reason why we are here, you've sold a four pack of Woody's bourbon and coke to a 15-year-old boy. Do you remember the sale at all? 
No. With the operator's recollection lapsing, perhaps a gentle reminder will do the trick. Now, I'll show you the photo again. Can I get proof that he's underage? It's a bit rich that he didn't ask for proof of age earlier, but wants it now. What sort of proof do you want that he's underage? Something that to verify that he is underage. Oh, well, perhaps you should have verified whether he was overage, rather than being worried about whether he's underage. Yeah, 15. but I mean, you guys can just sort of say, yeah, he was 15, and he had a way, had a way like That would be lying. I have known cops to lie. Oh, we've done this before. I know, I know. I'm telling you, yeah. he's 15. If need be, when we go to court, yeah. I can produce his birth certificate. Bearing in mind this is your second sale. The owner can choose to negotiate a voluntary suspension of trade now with Paul and Chris, or face prosecution and potentially greater penalties by the Liquor Licensing Authority. Do you want a court hearing or do you want to negotiate a suspension period? What's the difference? Well, if you want the proof that he's not 18, then we'll go to court. Come back with an offer on the period. I don't offer. Chris and Paul depart. The operator now has a couple of days to decide whether to opt for voluntary suspension or go to a hearing. Very argumentative man. He got done um, less than a year ago, so it's, um, this is a second sale. He wants proof that he was 15 years old rather than focusing on he should have been able to establish whether he was over 18 in the first place. You know, at the end of the day, he's made a mistake. Admittedly, that's a mistake that shouldn't have happened and under no circumstances should happen but you know we've got to be fair about it and we've got to give them an opportunity to to sort it out the previous sale saw the operator penalized with a two-day suspension of his license and a one-month suspension of his manager's certificate because this is a second offense paul and chris are requesting more severe penalties a four-day suspension of license at an estimated loss of fifteen thousand dollars in sales and a three-month suspension of his manager's certificate Back with Environmental Protection Officer Naomi Middleton on the Kapiti coast. Massive numbers of dead fish have washed up along 50 kilometres of beach. We can't really rule out any possible cause at this stage. It could be an environmental contaminant or um, we could be looking at a biotoxin. Twelve hours later, the new tide has washed even more dead fish ashore. Fearing that a dangerous toxin may be causing the deaths, samples are rushed to Biosecurity New Zealand laboratories. What we are looking for would be infectious causes of disease. The scientists are trying to untangle the mystery of the dead fish by finding a link to either man-made contaminants, biotoxins or some other unidentified cause. Pop a bacterial loop in there. So just take out the heart here. The tissues in every major organ are dissected and inspected. Swabs are taken to be cultured for possible bacterial infections and tissue samples taken for closer examination. Take a little bit of gut just to make sure we don't have some kind of nasty gut disease going on. You can see it's got a little bit of nasty mucus-like stuff in there, so can sample that and have a look. Despite the urgency of the situation, the science involved will take time. The histopathology has to fix for at least 24 hours and we have to trim it. It then goes off to get processed into very, very thin sections, five one thousandth of a millimetre thick. The tissues prepared onto slides and checked under the microscope for evidence of toxins, disease or distress. The bacterial plates, well they can grow something overnight or some types of bacteria can take up to 12 weeks to grow. But bacteria are not the only pathogens that may have caused the fish deaths. If we're worried about um, viruses and we want to try and grow viruses on cell lines, well that's at least three to four weeks. It's a movable feast. The good news, after 48 hours, no more dead fish washed ashore. The laboratory ruled out any evidence of an infectious agent or toxic pollutant. MAF and the Greater Wellington Regional Council later concluded that the dead fish were either dumped from a trawler or transported in a stormy current from deep to shallow waters, contracting decompression sickness. From the North Shore City Council, Building and Compliance Officers Graham Jones and Karima Fuad have been out inspecting an illegal dwelling in a carport that should have been removed. Bastards take the sink out, you see, and have a general sort out, and it's not been done, has it? On top of that, they found another illegal addition outside. Oh, we just had a wander around, we've got a garden shed here that's had a, a kitchen put in it. 
With the evidence now pointing to a very dodgy tenanting situation, as well as environmental concerns, Graham and Karima are back a week later to meet with the property manager, hoping to view inside the main dwelling. Hi, it's Graham from Northshire City Council. You alright? They start by walking the property manager through the exterior problems. This kitchen shouldn't even be here. OK. Right? Yep. Graham has council plans that show how the property should look without all the illegal additions outside. I've yep. got the original plans for the house. OK. So this is the upstairs and this yep. is the downstairs. I want to have a look into this room. So okay. I want to know how this has been used. Graham's concerned that if the outside is anything to go by, there will be more illegal modifications inside. Can we go in and have a look at that? Um, um, I don't have the... Graham gets inside, but the one room he wants to see is hidden behind locked doors. I need to get into that bottom piece. Can we go through the house and I want to see how it's connected? It's not connected. The downstairs area is locked off and being tenanted separately. Graham's suspicions have been confirmed. This is not the single dwelling it's supposed to be. He departs for now, but Graham's not taking any chances this time. Later, he heads back to the property manager's office with a formal written warning. I'm going to issue them with an abatement notice under the Resource Management Act, basically to remove the dishwashing facilities to rent the house out as one household. And also, we're going to ask them to remove the shuttering from around the deck so that the vehicles can park underneath it as per the last set of plans. The owners now have a month to act, or they will face severe fines, penalties or potentially prosecution. On a later visit, the property had been returned to the original state as approved in council plans, and the owners escaped further action through the courts.